Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. And I think that this is the message really of Dorothy Day for many of us, that we're always in danger of sort of flying off into the sky, of thinking that, boy, later on when the crisis comes, I'm going to be great. Or if I just wasn't in this situation, I would be more charitable. If I had my debts paid, I'd get more involved in trying to help other people. It's always a matter of put it off or escape into some fantasy kind of world. A lot of people of us who think we're Christians, we say, well, we love everybody. But that universal love of everybody detracts us from helping people here and now. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Father Charles Ritter, head of the Office of Community Relations for the Diocese of Toledo. Today, Father Basic and Father Ritter discuss Dorothy Day. Here's Father Basic. Charlie, I'm glad that you agreed to come and speak with me on this program. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, Dorothy Day a Catholic social activist, and I wanted you to come and speak with me about her because of your own involvement in the area of social justice, being the head of our Office of Community Relations, and uh, interested in the area of uh, peace and uh, the various social issues of our time. So why don't we uh, begin by just recalling a bit about Dorothy Day, because that name perhaps is not terribly familiar to many people. Dorothy Day died in the recent past, uh, this past November, I think it was, and uh, at the age of 83, and had spent her whole life, really, in working on social justice causes. I don't know, in your own experience, do you find that people uh, know her name or not, or is she familiar, or... I would say that outside the group of people directly involved in social justice concerns themselves, she's kind of one of those figures who people may have maybe heard the name but can't give you anything more than just it sounds familiar. Right. Um, she, well, see, I, I, my own opinion is that she's extremely important for our time, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk about her was to sort of make her better known because I think that she's got a really important message for us. That message relates to her very concrete understanding of the Christian gospel, the way she thought that uh, doc, the law of love should be put into operation on a daily basis. But again, before we get into that, I've got to get back and at least uh, we ought to bring up some of the ideas of her life. Born in 1897, I think it was, and right. traveled around a bit as a youngster. She was in San Francisco for a while, moved to Chicago, and went to the University of Illinois. And uh, my own understanding of her is that very early in her life she got interested in uh, helping the poor and in concerned about the rights of working people. Already when she was in high school she read Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov and was very taken by that. She read some of the Russian radicals and she, she seemed to demonstrate an innate care for the people who were downtrodden, the poor and dispossessed in our world. And so when she went to the University of Illinois, she wrote for uh, some of the campus publications. I think she had socialist kind of leanings at that time. And I don't think she really was terribly taken by most of her classes, and she ended up dropping out after a couple of years. And she ended up going to New York and... She spent some time there. She eventually got married, went to Europe for a while. Interestingly enough, wrote a novel during that time, and uh, yeah, one that was yeah. quite successful. And, in fact, she got a little bit of money later on when Hollywood uh, bought the rights uh, to that particular novel. And then that marriage um, ended up breaking up, and she took up with another man, entered into what she always called a common law marriage with him, and mm -hmm. by him had a daughter, Tamar, and um, it was after the birth of her daughter that it seemed this really important thing happened. She, for some reason or another, wanted that daughter to be baptized, and uh, she went ahead and had her baptized, although Dorothy Day herself was not of Catholic background. She had her baptized in the Catholic community, and then shortly after, um, she herself uh, became a convert to Catholicism. 
And uh, this seems to have been a major point in her life. I don't know that I really understand that part of it very well when you read her autobiography or the biographies about her. I don't think they give very good explanations of it. But she, I heard her on television one time. Uh, she was interviewed um, in a program. I'm trying to don't recall the exact details. It was back in 1973. I don't know if you've ever... Have you ever heard her talk or seen her? Or Just anything? some short clips in terms of things on television or news clips, things like that. I've no. never heard her give talks or anything like that. Yeah, you know, I heard her once for just a few minutes, and um, for some reason I can't think of this interview program. But uh, she said at that time that the church attracted her because it was the church of the poor, and uh, which you and I know isn't always clearly demonstrated. But she saw it that way and uh, for, was taken by Catholicism. And then shortly uh, after this time, she had sort of an aimless period where she wanted to do something with her life. And then she met this fe- person, uh, Peter Morin, a French okay. peasant who had come over to the United States and was uh, very taken by what they call French personalism, that the notion that love had to have sort of a concrete character to it. And... Peter Morin had this idea of establishing these houses of hospitality and of um, these agrarian communes where people would go and live and, and grow food and where the poor would be welcome. And so it was in really May 1st, 1933, when the Catholic Worker newspaper was established, which really became very important. May Day in New York at that time was a big communist rally going on, and Dorothy Day was at Peter Morin's insistence published this paper for a penny a copy, and they went out in this crowd of communists and were selling this paper uh, for a penny a copy. And that's how it started, and this uh, paper is still published yet today, uh, all these years later, and still... Still a going pen- at a penny a copy. <laughs> penny it's probably copy. the only thing that hasn't suffered from inflation in the American scene since that time. Yeah. That, that combination of circumstances that all came together in, in the package that was Dorothy, as you say, her coming from... Uh, certainly not a a strongly even religious background. Uh, Her meeting Peter Morin, and if that acquaintance had never developed, it's quite possible that much of what later developed in Dorothy Day's life wouldn't have. Um, Her, as you said, her practical, concrete concern for the reality of poverty and of poor people, rather than approaching that whole thing from some kind of theoretical kind of from the principles working down kind of thing, she dealt with people. And all through her life, her uh, refusal to get caught up in very nebulous, theoretical kind of talking about poverty, she insisted on being a very concrete and practical kind of person, even to the point that uh, I'm sure drove some of the people that worked with her in later life right up the wall. Um, but the, the coincidentalness of things, um, she would have been about 20 at the time of the Russian Revolution, uh, and certainly had she been born ten years before that or five years after that, it might have strongly affected her life in a different way. Um, she was uh, taken by uh, the Marxists for a while. In other words, she associated with a lot of Marxists before her conversion to Catholicism, was of a socialist bent, wrote that way, mm-hmm. but really, I think, found that too narrow. And at the time of her conversion to Catholicism, I think her Marxist friends were very taken aback and surprised that he had moved in this direction. But I don't think she really ever found Marxism to be what she was looking for. My own perception is that it was too narrow, too constricting, and uh, didn't have a broad enough vision. I think that's really what she ended up getting from Peter Morin, myself. I would suspect, too, without ever having read in in detail any of the biographies done of her, that... um, it may well have been that it, at that point that the the approach to the whole general socialist and Marxist position was too theoretical for her. It was too much a matter of principle mm. and real live people got overlooked and, and that was, as you said at the beginning, at just the very core of what made her tick. You had to deal with the reality of people. I think that uh, you're, I remember an author um, writing about her in that way, saying that she did re- that she did really find it all too theoretical, and she'd go to these meetings and wasn't terribly concerned with it at all. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. She did whatever theory she did have seemed to have really taken hold in the terms of this fellow Peter Morin, who was a, a remarkable figure. She thought of him as a saint and. Uh, 
she insisted that you know he was uh, in, in a sense the founder of the movement she always looked up to him and uh, okay. and gave him all kinds of credit evidently he was a strange fellow he really didn't wasn't an academic he had learned all this stuff on his own and he came to the United States and was just sort of traveling around and wherever he would find a group of people he'd talk to them about the social encyclicals of the Catholic Church and the importance of concrete uh, expressions of love and uh, he would uh, just uh, ramble on and on and I guess she could listen to him for hours and they would gather in these places in New York and just with small groups try to raise their consciousness about social issues. One of the uh, items that I had noted in uh, someone talking about the origins of, of the Catholic worker and particularly the publication uh, that as Dorothy did come into contact with the Catholic Church and began to be aware of some of the things that had been written in church teaching, that one of the thrusts, at least, of the Catholic worker was to try to somehow bring the awareness of some of that social justice teaching to people who certainly otherwise would have had no contact with it whatsoever, even in terms of their own background, uh, perhaps just people completely outside the Catholic community. That she saw that as something of a bridge. Um, and the whole insistence of, through the whole history of the paper on uh, trying to, to bridge that gap between the, the very ordinary, common, working person and the thinkers, uh, and the bringing together people who, who wanted to theorize but who needed real live people around to keep that concrete, and the poor, the working class themselves, who needed to be in touch with the rich tradition that was there in Christian social thought, and would have had no contact with it whatsoever. And so I think she saw herself very much as kind of a bridge person. Yes, she needed to bring it down to the masses. She wrote that her column uh, in the paper for years, well, all the way through the history, all the way up to the end, the last issue that I saw was the, uh, I think, October-November issue. It started being bi-monthly in mm -hmm. uh, certain instances. And she had her column in there called On Pilgrimage. I think that's the way she okay. thought of herself, On Pilgrimage, always in motion and, and learning and uh, gradually developing her ideas. She was a journalist all her life. Her father was a journalist. She picked mm -hmm. that up. She started writing when she was in college and, and saw herself as the editor and was the editor of this paper, The Catholic Worker, all throughout her life and did write this column. She wrote, uh, I think, about six different books, two autobiographies. The one uh, it's, that's best known, I guess, is The Long Loneliness. I think that was published around 1952. It's out of print now. Early, early 50s. But um, it is um, uh, a good portrayal of um, her own perceptions of things, and you sort of get inside of her mind. Talking about books about her, the other important book is uh, this one called um, A Harsh and Dreadful Love by William Miller, which is probably the best biography of Dorothy Day. I want to get back to some of that later on. But to, she was a writer um, herself, a journalist, and she, she did, had, was good at vivid description. She could describe the scenes of poverty or the rallies or demonstrations where she was. And she um, always wrote in the concrete kind of terms. You don't find technical theology in her writings. As you well pointed out, she wasn't interested in the speculative side of it. She was interested in being with the poor and caring for them and working for the various causes. There's an interesting linkage, too, with another figure who comes out of somewhat that same period in New York, uh, was perhaps more widely known than Dorothy Day, at least in some circles, uh, and that's Merton, of course, Thomas Merton. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in the, the late 20s and early 30s that Merton was at Columbia. Um, he has indicated, apparently, in some of his correspondence that if it were not for the sort of witness that was being given by the Catholic Worker Movement, people like Dorothy Day, he quite probably would have never you know, actively pursued an interest in the Catholic Church. I know. It's, it's, um, it's really quite remarkable. Um, the way she influenced so many people, even the playwright Eugene O'Neill was a drinking companion of right. hers in her early days. She used to be out with him carousing late at night and saw in him a really a, a very religious kind of figure. Uh, John Kennedy came and visited uh, the Catholic Worker House with his older brother, I think, in his younger days, and uh, and was very influenced by Dorothy Day. John Cogley, who many people know and wrote for the Catholic Worker in Chicago, was influenced Michael Harrington, who people know from the uh, leftward uh, uh, wing of the Democratic Party today, and who writes a lot about socialism and so on. 
So a lot of people who became very well, well known or influential around the country really were interest, uh, influenced by Dorothy Day. And she tended to, uh, to go where the action was. Um, the issues around pacifism in just about every war that we were involved in from the time of the, the 20s on up through the Vietnam period, uh, the farm worker struggle in California, I think that was her last official time in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, all of the concerns that surfaced in the country, they weren't exclusively limited to the large city, urban, poor kind of situation in which the Catholic worker began in New York. Uh, but uh, Dorothy had a way of, of going where the action was and where, again, ordinary people uh, were, were facing struggles relating with social justice, uh, where there was especially questions of passive, and she was probably one of the strongest voices in terms of a pacifist movement within uh, the Catholic Church and, and the Christian churches in general in the United States. It's true. Let, let's take up some of those concrete things that she did. I know the first time I can remember she was in jail, she went to Washington and in, in, uh, was demonstrating in favor of women's um, suffrage mm -hmm. and uh, ended up in jail on that occasion. I remember another time when she, in the Civil Rights Movement, she went down to America's Georgia, I think, and there was a commune down there that had been uh, trying to work things out, a um, more communal style of living for a number of years, and was starting to get a lot of flack from people around there. And she went down uh, to s give support to them, and she was sitting in a car out in front of the commune, sort of, and uh, another car came bound, uh, by and peppered the, the car with gunshot, and uh, mm -hmm. she was yeah. not hit, but uh, she was really in action. And as you said, uh, one of the main things was this supporting the rights of the working person. So you go back into the 30s, when, uh, right when the Catholic Worker Movement was founded, and during the time of the Depression and so on, boy, she was really in there. She was demonstrating for child labor laws, and that continued throughout her whole life. And you mentioned the one, I think it was in 1973, she went out to California to support uh, Flock right. um, the, and the um, United Farm, uh, United Farm Worker right. Movement. Chavez. Yeah, with Cesar Chavez, who wrote some beautiful things about Dorothy upon her death. Yeah. And so she ended up in jail out there. She was in jail many times during her life. Sometimes almost, uh, you know, very directly. You mentioned the one about pacifism. Um, for about a four-year period, New York had this thing where they, on a certain day, when they would have civil uh, defense maneuvers mm. and would clear uh, the city and so on and make people get off the streets and so on. Well, she would refuse to do that. She would go to a park with, I think, Eamon Hennessy and some others, and they would notify the police ahead of time that they were not going to do this, that they felt that it was um, part of a war-making effort and put a war psychology on the country and that we shouldn't really be doing that. And so she would uh, notify the police that they would be out there uh, violating the law, civil rights, civil disobedience, and would get carted off to jail again. I think it was about four years in a row that they ended up doing that. And yet in all of that, because there's very much of an image of a very, very fringe, radical type person there, in so many other ways, personally and religiously, uh, Theologically, liturgically, she was quite conservative. Uh, she tended to challenge the authority of the government much more than she did the authority of the church. Uh, I'm sure there are times that she felt the church was way too distant from the kinds of concrete concerns she was dealing with. Um, and keeping in mind the age thing, when she was in California with the farm workers in the early 70s, she was a woman uh, of middle age 70 herself. So this was not simply some young scatterbrained woman running around the country. This was an extremely mature woman who had put in a lot of time and years of reflection and sharing over this. And so uh, radical is really not an apt label for her. No, it's, she's, uh, defies our ordinary labeling, really. In social issues, she, you know, was... Uh, saw the radical character of the Christian message in the terms of the, the word radical meaning root. She mm -hmm. got to the root or heart of the message and said, well, Jesus said we're supposed to love the poor, so I'm going to do it. Here One of her are. traveling companions, Eileen Egan, who I happen to have met in New York when I was staying there, um, and told me a few things about Dorothy Day, but I heard her say one time that... Uh, uh, she was influenced by Dorothy just this simple way. Dorothy Day one day said, you know, well, we should see Christ in the poor, and therefore he's in the poor, therefore we could care for the poor. And it turned Eileen Egan's life around. I mean, just to hear this simple statement, the root 
message of the gospel just changed everything for her. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, the way you pointed out that she was a very traditional Catholic in many ways. She, once, she often made the statement that if Cardinal Spellman told her to shut down the Catholic worker and to stop the whole movement, that she would do it. Mm-hmm. She would do it just like that. She said her rosary all throughout her life. In fact, uh, after her last public appearance in 1976, which was at the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia, where she gave a, a, a traditional kind of okay. speech for her, mm-hmm. then she had a heart attack that very night. And uh, after that speech, and the rest of her life was lived very much close to her Catholicism. She would go to Mass each day, and she would say her rosary and spend time with her daughter, mm-hmm. Tamar, who and her, I think, about seven grandchildren that she had. So in many ways, she lived. A, she was conventional or traditional, really, in her understandings of things. It's interesting, uh, recent uh, edition of uh, Christianity in Crisis, and talking about that conservative side of her, and her really, as you related in terms of Cardinal Spellman, uh, having what you might almost consider a, an extreme you know, reverence for the authority of the Church. But their comment was that in turn, it says, and I'm quoting from, from the editorial on Christianity in Crisis, it says in turn, no churchman ever quite dared or ever quite wanted to use authority to silence her. It would have been too blatantly a silencing of the Sermon on the Mount. It was just (laughs) something obvious about the rightness of what she was doing as held up against the background of the whole basic Christian message. I think that uh, people just recognized her goodness in many ways. Um, I have a quote, too, that I wanted to mention just to to show that we're not talking about a fringe person here. Here's David O'Brien, a a historian who has written since Dorothy Day's death. um, The Dorothy Day, in my view, was quote, the most significant, interesting, and influential person in the history of American Catholicism. The most interesting and influential person in the whole history of the Catholic Church in the United States. This is really quite an amazing thing. And I think that it gets back to uh, her notion of Christian love. I love the title of this book, uh, William Miller's book, A Harsh and Dreadful Love. As a matter of fact, it is a line from Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. And in there, um, he is, uh, Father Zazima is uh, talking about Christian love, and he says, or, or the real character of love, he says, love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. And I think that this is the message, really, of Dorothy Day for many of us, that we're always in danger of sort of flying off into the sky, of thinking that, boy, later on when the crisis comes, I'm going to be great. Or if I just wasn't in this situation, I would be more charitable. Or if I had my debts paid, I'd get more involved in trying to help other people. It's always a matter of put it off or escape into some fantasy kind of world. A lot of people of us who think we're Christians, we say, well, we love everybody. But that universal love of everybody detracts us from helping people here and now. And it seems to me that that really is the great genius of Dorothy Day. For her, love was a harsh and dreadful thing. It was harsh in the sense that she went among the poor. She lived right in the Lower East Side of New York with the poor. They were often in her room. They were in her space bothering her. She talks about the smelly bodies and and the need, uh, you know, to the temptation to get away from all of that. So it was a a concrete kind of love that said, hey, if this person's in need, I'm going to care for him. And not as a handout or just as a dole. She constantly insisted that she respect people, respect the dignity of the people. There were more than 40 of those uh, hospitality houses started around the United States, these Catholic worker houses of hospitality where the poor could come, where there'd be a soup line, and they would be trying to uh, take care of... uh, the the individual people, and she always insisted that they be treated with dignity and respect. So she wouldn't just talk about peace, but she would demonstrate for it and be willing to go to jail over it. So a harsh and dreadful thing. I think it's a message that we really need. And also, it was a message delivered by a lay woman, the head of a single-parent family who was not a nun, who was not a priest, and in a time like our own where there is a growing stress, again, on the essential role of the ordinary 
man and woman to bear witness to what the gospel is all about. Dorothy Day is, is quite a figure that is he, um, as O'Brien talks about her being perhaps one of the most distinctive figures in the history of American Catholicism, uh, a great many of those other figures are priests and sisters, and Dorothy Day is, is a very, very, in a good sense, ordinary woman. She's somebody I suppose people can relate to. She had her flings, she had her passionate times, she had, uh, was, had a child, um, she was married, she knew the New York scene, she cavorted with the Marxists and the socialists. Uh, she was worldly wise uh, in many ways. She, was, she knew what was going on, and yet this conversion experience turned things around for her, and, or at least gave a focus to her energies. That's more my perception of her, is not that there was a sudden conversion, but that she always had this care for the poor, and she was looking for the way to do it. By being a communist, no, it wouldn't work. And then finally, the Catholic Church gave her a stability and some place where she could stand and, and an authority and a long-standing tradition. I think she liked that, a deep spirituality. And then uh, Peter Morin's vision of uh, having these communes and having these houses of hospitality and clarifying these social issues and listening to the social encyclicals of the Pope, that seemed to give her a vision. It gave her something to hang on to. Then she used to have retreats periodically. She was big on going on retreats, and I think there she found a lot of, of solid theology, something to link uh, her, her energy and passion onto. I think that in writing about her myself, I said at uh, one time that something about in Dorothy Day, she was this great person and her passion and the Christian tradition and a, and a healthy theology sort of came together for her in this one person to, to give us this outstanding person. Charlie, I really like the point you made, especially about that she's a lay woman with all these experiences, and, and what a model to put forward of a spirituality, it's a real a woman who really made a difference in our world. I would love to see people be more acquainted with her thinking, that we'd know more about Dorothy Day, this great person who uh, reached down to the poor and helped in so many ways, who worked uh, strongly for peace and put her body on the line. She didn't just uh, speak in uh, words, you know, her, it was her, her real her actions that made the difference. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Father Charles Ritter, head of the Office of Community Relations for the Diocese of Toledo. The topic of this week's Reflections was Dorothy Day. If you have any questions about today's program or any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mark Ferguson. Executive producer is Mary Beth Kirshner. Reflections is brought to you by the Genesis Radio Network.